watch NCIS, Bones, CSI, and all of those, they make it look like within 24, 48 hours, all that's done and taken care of. Now, the gentleman that we watched the other day, or the video that I showed the other day, um, who's the uh, former GBI agent who did um, Tri-State tri pre Prematory. Remember, it takes a lot of people, not just one person. This is, I'll say, as close as they can get, but still, they use a lot of what we call Hollywood sens uh, sensationalism to it, too. Uh, but the thing that I liked about this is, okay, here's Angelina Jolie. Here's the train coming down, and she's doing this. But guess what? What was she doing? What was right behind her? evidence. She was preserving that scene. So, now with that, I'm going to get out of the way. <laughs> Can you tell I know the dog? <laughs> myself, I started, started being a police officer in 2016. Prior to that, I was in the military for three and a half years. Um, medically discharged in 2015 from the military. 2016, June 2016, I applied to be a police officer at the Police Department. Um, the, I was on patrol for uh, three years. Um, after patrol, I joined crime suppression and narcotics, worked that for a little while while I was assigned here as the resource officer at Bradwell when I was fully retired. I mean, you probably remember him. Um, he actually retired once the whole COVID thing jumped off. He was going to retire after the school, after the school you know, school year anyway. Um, but he had an early retirement when school closed down. So he decided to leave. Um, my contact information is right here if you need me. You all are seniors, so if you're interested in like forensic stuff for any reason, you need to get in contact, or you want to get in contact with me to get further information about what I'm going to talk about today, um, you can call me at the police department 368 8211. I have a school email, but once I leave here and somebody replaces me in about three years, that email will be non existent. So my other email is up here, marsolm at All right, so we're going to talk about crime scene preservation. Um, who can give me the importance of crime scene preservation? Anybody? Why do we think it's important? Anybody? Want to take a shot at it? Somebody? I got to call on somebody? Probably. Right. Let's take a shot at it. Preservation is important. Because, I mean, it's important stuff. Like, that can help you solve the crime. Excellent. Why not? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Good, good answer. That's exactly right. Given a box of instruction as a student, you, students will learn methods used to effectively process crime scenes and collect and secure evidence in accordance with recommended best practices crime lab guidelines and applicable law regulations. Objectives, you will learn today, identify three types of evidence. You will demonstrate the correct procedures for securing a crime scene. Identify the correct procedure for ensuring that the chain of custody for evidence is maintained. Demonstrate the correct procedure for collecting, preserving, and identifying physical evidence. Before we go any further, we're not looking at, well, you can't see it anyway. I'm going to show up for you. You probably can't see that, but I'll see it right there. Give me a definition of evidence. DNA. Okay. That's a good example. Anybody? Go for it. 
You're about to raise your hand. Yeah, uh, running left behind from a crime. Okay. All right, anybody else? <laughs> How about you, ma'am? Evidence. Definition of evidence. In your own words, it doesn't have to be. Uh, what'd you say? Remnants left behind from a crime. Okay. Said remnants left behind from a crime. Alright. How about read that definition for me? definition from Webster's Dictionary. You look up the definition of evidence, that's what you're going to get. Okay? What about for law purposes? How about this definition? Ma'am, can you read that for me? Law definition. Any mysterious items or assertions of fact that may be submitted to a competition, competition, competent, competent to rule as a manner of asserting the truth of any alleged matter of fact under investigation. In hindsight, what this definition is saying, evidence is your proof. Make sense? It is your proof. Uh, you need evidence to prove innocence. You need evidence to prove guilt. You need evidence to prove that a crime, in fact, occurred, right? It is your proof. How are you going to prove it? All right, what are the three types of evidence? Can anybody think? Okay, good. Anybody else? Nope. Direct evidence, real evidence, physical, circumstantial evidence. Okay, what is direct evidence? Anybody want to take a stab at that? What do you think direct evidence means? Sir, can you read that definition for me? Direct evidence? Direct evidence is the most powerful type of evidence as it requires no interference. The evidence alone is the proof. It strongly supports the truth of assertion. It has a major role in determining guilt or innocence. Direct evidence. In other words, for example, and there's going to be an example right here. Security camera showing a person breaking into a store and stealing items. If a camera showed me breaking into, I don't know if they have Radio Shack anymore, but breaking into Radio Shack. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> breaking into Radio Shack or breaking into Walmart. And the security camera picked me up or showed me breaking into Walmart. I don't have a mask or anything on my face because I'm just dumb like that. And I'm walking out with a 35 inch flat screen TV. PlayStation 5. Right? That Which camera, has happened. That is, and that's why I use the example, because it's happened. Right? That camera picks me up. Police officers, they surround me because the alarm goes off. They tie me to the crime by a security camera when I go to trial. Okay? Because that security camera caught me in the act, that is direct evidence. All right? What about if I commit a murder? Bang, I shoot somebody, right? I commit a murder, I try to hide the murder weapon, try to hide the gun, but they recover it. I wasn't wearing gloves, because again, I'm just dumb like that, right? My fingerprints are all over the gun. Would that be considered real evidence or not? Okay, both. Good job. Right? So, they do ballistics tests and they determine that the bullet fired came from the gun that had my fingerprints on it. <coughs> Direct evidence, because they can directly link me. It's my gun, it's my fingerprints, the bullet came from that gun. All that is direct evidence, because they can link me to that crime. All right? What about an audio recording? Yeah, I did it. So what? <laughs> audio recordings, right? Yeah, I stabbed that guy. So what? Big deal. Right? In other words, direct evidence is your smoking gun. 
In other words, the smoking gun is what is going to get you a conviction. It's going to prove what happened. Right? Then you have real evidence, physical evidence, things that are tangible, things you can touch. Okay? Good example. The gun that I fired, real evidence. Anything that I can hold in my hand as a prosecuting attorney and show a jury will be considered real evidence. All right? Fingerprints. You guys did some fingerprint dusting, right? No fingerprint listing. No. They can't use no You didn't talk about uh, fingerprints? So we'll cover fingerprints? We did fingerprints. Like we did our own. Okay. So fingerprints. You go to a crime scene, you're a crime scene analyst, you go to a crime scene, Sorry. and um, you find a fingerprint, right? You lift that fingerprint, that latent fingerprint, and you do everything you have to submit to a trial. That fingerprint belongs to the suspect. Boom, you get a conviction, right? Real evidence. You can show that fingerprint. You can show uh, uh, testings of the suspect's fingerprint and compare it with the fingerprint that you lifted from the crime. You can tie that suspect to that crime with fingerprints, right? What about knives, guns, shell cases? Again, the example that I used about shooting a person. They take those shell casings and they match them. Real evidence. They do a ballistic test and match the shell casing. To, from yes to the gun and determine that the shell casing found at the scene matches the one at the ballistic test. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I don't know much about guns. So is it like is certain bullets that go to a certain gun? Mm -hmm. or is, okay. For example, shell casings, blood samples. Blood samples is a good one. Let's say. Uh, Again, I committed that murder, but in the process, the victim actually stabbed me or something like that. So now I'm dripping blood over the crime, the crime scene. Right? They found my blood sample. They find they go to the crime scene. The best way to go to the crime scene found two samples of blood. One belonged to the victim. One belonged to the suspect. They test those blood samples, but again, you have an eyewitness who saw me running from that crime scene, so they arrest me. They do a test on the blood sample found, on the second blood sample found at the crime scene, and then they test my blood to see if there's a match, right? Those results are considered real evidence, okay? OJ did it, <laughs> right? That glove, they collect it from the murder scene, they discovered a pair of gloves. And you see OJ, put the gloves on like, no, they don't fit, so could possibly been me, right? Couldn't have been me because the gloves don't fit. All right? Circumstantial. Circumstantial evidence is evidence that re relies on an interference to connect to a conclusion of fact. Blood and fingerprints, although are real evidence, blood and fingerprints, they can also be considered circumstantial evidence because they require further processing. All right, like the example that I gave you. I shoot the victim, but before I shot the victim, I was cut or stabbed, right? They have to now test my blood. You go to court, say there's no witnesses, right? I got a cut on my finger, I got cut in the hand or something like that, there's no witnesses, right? Forget everything you know about the gun. You don't even, you don't even know because you never found the gun. All you have is speculation at this point. Well, you were the last person with the victim, but for whatever reason you have probable cause to take you to trial, and they say, well, we found a fingerprint. We found blood, but there were no further testing performed on it. On blood? On the blood. There's, there's no further testing because you have a prosecuting attorney, a sorry prosecuting attorney, who didn't do their job, right? Prosecuting attorney didn't do their job, didn't do further testing, didn't test the fingerprints. But you have built your case off of the blood, yeah. off of the fingerprints, but nothing was processed because somewhere there was a loophole 
and this didn't happen before trial. That's crazy. Right? It happened. I, I was about to do that. What you for that though? It happened. Okay? Yeah, Circumstantial. And because none of this happened, if you have a good defense attorney, your, good, your defense attorney is going to say, Your Honor, I object. This is all circumstantial. We have nothing proving or tying my client to this case. So, how did he come pick you up if they couldn't tie you to this case? Like, to the blood and stuff? Like, how did they, if they were, you said there were no witnesses then? So, so, no, say there was a witness then. Okay, yeah. Hey, he did it. Let's go take your word, they, you know, eyewitness. This is what they did. This is what they did. So they got the did, evidence. So, how did OJ get around? Let's get to somebody out of Hmm? He had a very good attorney. Uh, Wasn't it the same? <laughs> Johnny Cocker. Yes. He, he did somebody else's case. I can't remember. Yeah. Was, uh, he, was it Conrad Murray? Was, was he the same one? It was just recent, last two or three years. I know the one you're talking about. Well, John, uh, he's the, the guy's. Uh, no, this has been longer ago because. Johnny Cocker's been dead. I was going to say Johnny Cocker's been dead for a while. But, um, I because I read something that was like they used the same attorney as OJ. I'll think was about it. Was it like a Netflix series or something about it? I don't even know. I just remember hearing that. All right. So, examples of circumstantial evidence. A witness says that the defendant, a witness says that she saw the defendant in her house, she heard screaming, and then she saw the defendant leave with a bloody knife. That's all suspicious, right? Yeah. He went into this house. I heard this woman scream, and he ran out with a bloody knife. What would you assume? He did it, right? Bloody? I mean, I got this Could have been. Could have been. Circumstantial, right? Yeah. Circumstantial, right? Who's to say? Who's to say that he walked in this house, and there wasn't already a third party there, the real suspect, who stabbed this woman, and he was trying to protect himself. He fought the suspect, raffled the knife away killed the suspect, and then ran because he was afraid. Now he's running out with a bloody knife. That's weird. Circumstantial, right? <laughs> All right, check this video out. This is a good video on um, preserving the crime scene.
collection of physical evidence should be carried out very thoroughly and only by properly trained personnel. Various methods of documenting, packaging, and real? should be used based on agency guidelines. Each piece of evidence should be considered separately when deciding on the best and most appropriate method of collection. Numerous types of bags, boxes, cans, tubes, and other containers are available to meet these needs. <laughs> if I don't, <laughs> isn't that all that dog guy? The No, it's from Mr. Nelson. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thanks a lot there, Jay. You was out there roller skate tennis on, weren't you? <laughs> Maybe. Well, you are from Atlanta. You should be able to. Uh, yeah. Beverly Hills Cop? Yep, Beverly Hills Cop. It's a, it's a guy. He was on Big Time Rush. He played Charlie Pichet. Right. right. <laughs> no, no, no. Nobody Eddie Murphy. Uh, hey, Goody's not there. Oh, that's just a long time ago. No, like, you know the guy who played Carlos' dad? That's why they have Google. Oh, God. <laughs> Y'all already know that. You were, you were six. I'm not sure. You're 16 now, right? No, I don't remember because I do not remember. I was a child, though. You're a senior? No. Junior. Uh, he's a little baby. <laughs> He's just right. a year older I'll than me. I'll check this video out. Pay, pay close attention to this video and keep in mind crime scene preservation, okay? When you watch this video. <laughs> Yep. Yes.
Yeah. She was my partner. I'm sorry. Mind, um, crime scene preservation and tell me that report wasn't supposed to be in there, was it? The who? The reporter that was in there taking pictures. Right. I thought, I thought it was no. the crime he's, he's supposed to be there, but he's supposed to be photographing the crime scene, but instead he's taking <laughs> oh, pictures of, of I thought it was like a, a, a newspaper report. Mm. Some of them may have a lot of them may have a right. right. What else? Some of them were just like playing limbo. My man's right. playing limbo in the back. What else? What <laughs> he else? Should, he should, that lady should not stump on that woman or on the Good. Good. What else? Uh, all that cotton shaking. Yeah. You know that. Right. What else? <laughs> the head and shoulder thing. Good. Okay. Now, what's the, what's the reason behind that? What could that cause? Him. His DNA getting on the. Um, right. Cross contamination, right? You on it, girl. Okay. What else did you see? What about all these cars right here? Yeah, that they should have blocked that off. Right. It wasn't even a fire. Why should they have why should they have blocked that stuff off right there instead of all those cars being pulled up? People won't be coming in and seeing what's going on. Okay. One main reason. For better the crime thing. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. All of that could be potential could potentially be part of the crime thing, right? Yeah. You got a hot you got a guy in a hot dog stand. Right. Uh, with a hot dog cart there, he's not essential. He shouldn't be there, right? right. Got an ice cream truck, he's not essential. What about that the mid truck right there? The, um, that kid that was on the, the jet ski in the front yard. Mm -hmm. What about that cement truck right there? Not essential to the investigation, right? Shouldn't be there. Okay? And what, the police is like all the way in the back compared to the other, like, the people that need to be there is not there. scene of any crime itself is evidence, right? That's what's important about crime scene preservation. Because you don't know what you're rolling up to. You go to a crime scene, like that one pretty much, let's just remove everything, all those vehicles and stuff that were parked there. All, those, all that space in and around could be considered a crime scene. Something happens in here. Say a murder or something happens right here in this room. Right? All of this. Well, the crime occurred, right? Wait, before what? you touch anything, this is all evidence. Everything in here, before it, before it has a chance to be examined by an examiner or an analyst, is considered evidence, right? It's, a, it's important to protect a crime scene. Improper protection of a crime scene will result in the loss, contamination, or unnecessary movement of physical, direct, or real evidence, right? The first person on scene, which will usually be a police officer, is responsible for scene security, protecting that crime scene. Pretty much the same thing. You are responsible for crime scene protection, and you are responsible for keeping unauthorized personnel out of that crime scene. You are responsible um, to keep unauthorized intrusion, right? Simply walking into a crime scene, you could disturb evidence, right? Security immediate crime scene area. Right? So if a victim is down on the ground, stabbed, or shot, right? The best and most crucial evidence is normally found at or near the site of the most critical action that was taken by the criminal. So if you got a stabbed victim on the ground, right? Everything around that victim could be the crucial evidence. It could make or break the case, right? Say for, uh, for example, you got a stabbed victim on the ground, um, and you got blood on the floor, right? That is crucial to your case. There's two blood, you, you don't know it, you don't know it right away, but there's blood on the floor. Trickles of blood, right? Those trickles of blood, they test it and determine that there's a separate sample, right? So there's now two samples of blood. You got the victim, and then you got an identified, an, an identified sample, right? What about 
evidence on the victim's body. Right? Similarly to the, the sign of a uh, forcible entry to a building, like a broken window, or immediately surrounding the area of a crack stage, normally has the greatest potential for yielding evidence. Everybody familiar with what happened at K, uh, K Jewelers? Yes. Uh, Here in Houseville? Oh yeah, somebody got rich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Still being investigated. Still. No, this is recently. Mm -hmm. so it went, it, it was, was a month. Yeah. No, it ain't been a month yet. Maybe this is recently. Weeks. It's probably been like three weeks. This wow. is recent. What happened was somebody broke into cage jewelers through the roof. Oh. They went through the roof of the building. They was pulling a high school yeah, right. 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 The yeah. tape was also cracked. They oh. had been playing in that. Yeah. Right. That was the inside. But line. what they're saying is, surrounding the cracked safe, that cracked safe, the evidence, the area around that safe, right, could be the most crucial evidence there. Fingerprints, right? Shoe prints. That was a month ago. That's right. Nice. nice. Okay. Be smart. All right. Put me on the case, coach. <laughs> All right. Protective measures for a crime scene. You want to rope off certain critical exits. The critical exits to this room will be these two entrances right here, right? Posting guard lessens the possibility of contaminating the crime scene. So you want to guard outside the front of here to make sure no unauthorized intrusions come in. Persons not essential to investigation should be kept out of the crime scene if they have no reason for being there. Again, back to our stab victim, right? You got bystanders, and now family members of the victims have arrived. I know they want to go and see and hug their loved one. They see them on the ground. First thing they're going to want to do is want to run up and pick them up and try to hug on them, right? You can't allow that to happen, especially if the crime scene has not been processed yet. Just by picking up and holding that loved one, you're destroying or cross-contaminating evidence, right? Trace, trace evidence. Fragile can be easily destroyed, moved, or contaminated. Hairs. Trace evidence, right? This is a crime scene security law. As the first officer on scene, or you can assign somebody to uh, establish security, this is a security law. The person Pulling security, name goes there, all that good stuff. Every person that comes in and out of that crime scene needs to be logged. The date and time they were in, the date and time they were out, given with what they did on that crime scene. What was their role? Did they cause any contamination? Like the guy walking around shampooing his hair, right? The detective picking the picture up off the, uh, off the wall there with no gloves on. He's moving stuff around, right? This is the crime scene entry log that we use at, at, at Hondo Police Department. That's what we use, pretty much self-explanatory. Name and title, date and time in, date and time out, and the reason for you being there, okay? No. This is an evidence Officer. log. Officer Plum. Okay, so say there's a crime that occurred, but like nobody, it's been a while before somebody called the police on him, or called the police, and it's like been people walking through it or something like that. How do y'all determine what's part of the crime and what's not? Like It's all part of processing. Make, that makes the job a lot harder, actually. This is an evidence law. It's, it's similar to a, an entry law. <laughs> But well, the difference for an evidence log is you describe what is for evidence. You describe what it is, gun, where it was found, in the bedroom, who found it, I found it, right? Then I take a picture of it. Any distinct markings? How did I package it? All right? Any other comments? What does D or I stand for? Direct or indirect. Okay. Direct or indirect? Yep. Oh. I thought she said direct or indirect. Collecting and preserving evidence. Again, the officer first assumes responsibility for the crime scene, must cooperate with detectives, laboratory examiners, and other specialists who may later process the crime scene. It is important to let detectives know if, in, if any evidence has been touched, moved from its original location. All right? 
Let's say I stumble across, I'm dispatched to a domestic, right? I go in and the suspect has shot, killed, or stabbed the victim, but he's still in there, right? He has a gun in his hand now, and I have to take him down. Mm. Or I walk in before the act happens, and I take him down, and I save the victim's life. Just because he's down, does that mean he's dead? No. He still holds a gun in his hand, right? Yeah, right. Double -double. We gotta go in there. We gotta go in there. Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. So you know how, well now, you know how officers be shooting people, mm. but like they say they shoot them because they had a gun, but they they shoot them in the head or something, like shoot them nine times. Is y'all trained to shoot people in spots just to knock them down and get the gun, or y'all just trained to kill if a person got a gun? We are trained to eliminate a threat to save somebody's life. That is how we're trained. We are trained to stop a threat. We'll talk about that later because it has nothing to do with what we're going with right now. Ask me offline, okay? okay? So, just because I go in, I save the victim's life. I shoot the perpetrator, he's down. Does that mean he's dead? No, but he's still clutching a gun in his hand. I go and I move the gun away. It's important for me to tell the detective, hey, I moved that gun out of his hand. Okay? Rule number one, crime scene preservation. Don't touch anything. All right? Even when you like, or well, before you collect evidence, is that considered or hmm? When you say like, don't touch nothing. Like, don't touch anything unless you are the one examining or analyzing that crime scene. Okay, so there's a specific person for that, so like this is officer that comes? Yes. Okay. All right, so moving into evidence collection. I had a video here, uh, but I did find another one written down. Just okay. You can go to YouTube. So you really should have just sat there, you like have to move back and forth. Take mop spot. <laughs> Acevedo said in a statement, Ms. Diaz's betrayal of the public trust and oath of office 
is inconsistent with the dedication of the men and women of the Houston Police Department and their tireless, honorable service. While we cannot overstate our depth of disappointment, we take solace in the fact that the investigation that led to Ms. Diaz's arrest was conducted by men and women of the HPD, the same organization and co-workers she betrayed. And Diaz's next court appearance is scheduled here next Monday at 9 a.m. Reporting live from downtown Houston, Keith Garth from KPRC Channel 2 News. What did she do wrong to you? They didn't explain expressly how she tampered with evidence, but when you're dealing with something like that, she was um, a narcotic detective or undercover narcotics officer, right? Evidence tampering. Narcotics and evidence cases, she could have destroyed evidence. And I'm willing to bet that she received that commendation for turning in two major drug um, operators because they either, A, got tired of her stuff and threatened to tell on her, so, hey, you gonna tell me? All right, cool. These guys are dealing. Boom, they're arrested. Yeah. Now she got accommodation for arresting two major drugs. Right? This particular video right here, I wish I could have shown you. Um, when it comes to evidence tampering here in this video, what happened is the uh, person collecting the evidence, the officer collecting the evidence, basically mishandled evidence. There were important cases that were, that were tied to the evidence, but because this officer mishandled the evidence, those cases were thrown out. Mm. Mishandling evidence is, is pretty much, uh, it could be, an evidence tampering doesn't have to be um, on purpose. It could be by accident. It could be me as an officer giving you, as another officer, transporting it because I didn't get you to sign for it, right? And because you gave it to her and she didn't sign for it, and she gave it to somebody else and they didn't sign for it. Evidence tampering, right? Mm -hmm. It's important to document. Document, document, document with everything dealing with evidence. You don't want any loopholes or anything. You don't want to leave the uh, defense attorney any room to come in and put reasonable doubt into a jury or a judge's head. Because the only, the only thing it takes be acquitted is reasonable doubt. All right. What happened in this case? The evidence clerk and the officer mishandled evidence, right? For that specific reason, and all those cases were thrown out. As a result, that officer was fired and charged for evidence tampering, and so was his supervisor. Those are felonies. All right. All right. Evidence collection. You want to make sure the scene is clearly marked. Yellow tape, rope, again, whatever you have to use to mark that tape, to mark that crime scene. All right. Before you collect evidence, you don't just go in again, moving stuff around. If you find something that you may that you believe may be tied to the case, you mark it. Because you don't want to move anything before the, the uh, crime scene photographer comes in and has the opportunity to take pictures of the evidence, where it was found, where it was located. You don't have number cards, improvise. Okay, use cardboard. I've done that before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. What you done solved? I haven't solved anything. Well, not any major crimes. We use the solving, we uh, leave the solving of the major stuff to the like detectives and stuff in the department. Yeah. yeah. But when it comes to like petty stuff, you know. The general rule for firearms and ammunition, they should not be disturbed. Valuable evidence might be found on cartridge cases as well as weapons. If finger visible fingerprints are present, in oil or grease on a weapon found in an outdoor crime scene in cold weather, it should not be moved indoors to a heated area. The heat may destroy the oil, the, the uh, oily uh, fingerprints. The heat can destroy that stuff. When recovering a weapon, never enter the stick or pencil into the bore in order to lift the weapon up. You know, we all see that on TV, right? They find a gun and they stick a pencil in to pick it up with a gun, you know? 
The weapon should be lifted up by the checker portion of the grip where the fingerprint cannot be uh, deposited. In other words, right here, okay? That's how you handle a weapon. Pick this up here. Right or wrong? Wrong. What if there's fingerprints inside there? Could there be fingerprints inside that trigger well right here? Alright. That's the right way to handle a weapon when you find it, when you're ready to collect it. Alright? When you're ready to package it, if you're not going to package it in a plastic bag and you have these boxes available, okay. mm. these boxes can also be used to package uh, evidence as well. Guns and knives. All right, shotgun. That top one up there is a shotgun box. The middle one is, of course, a handgun box. And then you got the bottom one, uh, a knife box. All right? That's how it's packaged. Yep, in the box. You got weapon evidence, your agency, all that good stuff right there, where it was found, what time you found it, and you got the chain of custody that we talked about. When it comes to chain of custody, this is what we use at Hansel Police Department. This is our chain of custody law, our evidence for chain of custody. Okay? You got the the uh, you got the item description, you got the quantity. Right? If you found three shell casings. The three shell cases are going to be item number one. And then quantity, of course, you put three. Right? So it doesn't take very much to write shell cases on this line. So as that's the only thing you found after you finish writing shell cases on that line, you're going to draw a line all the way across. You're going to go down, draw another line, and then a zigzag. What's the purpose of that? Can somebody tell me that? Huh? What's the purpose of us writing a line or drawing a line? Behind evidence. Oh, so nobody can try and like add stuff to it or take Good it. Good job. Exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Down here you have your chain of custody. Okay? The first person who found the evidence, their name goes on the line first. I found the gun. Alright? My name goes here. Alright? It was released by the crime team. I received it because I found it. Right? Then it's going to be released from me, released by, and received by the evidence clerk. The evidence clerk then releases it to the evidence locker. Everything has to be documented. If I found it and I'm releasing it to you, found by, received by. You release it to her, released by, or received, or released by, and received by. You released it, she received it, right? So y'all have to do that every time y'all like. Every single exchange, every exchange, every exchange, okay? If you handle it, if you handle it, your name goes on there. So before the, the person releasing the bag, before they give it to the person receiving it, they got to sign that paper. That's right. Exactly right. This is how we package evidence. This is how our clerk, our evidence uh, clerk wants us to do it. Okay? Again, we got the labels. She actually wants us to staple the bag, knowing that we're done with it and it was secured. Because what happens if you rip the staples from a plastic bag? She knows that it's been torn, right? Somebody tampered with it. Right. She has a very, very stressful job at the police department because she can be audited. Remember how I talked about the, uh, the guy in that video? Uh, was not tracing the evidence properly. Evidence clerks are audited. What does that mean? That means somebody comes in and checks their work. Oh, so it's like a person above them, like the head of the Yes, I guess you could say that. Mm -hmm. For the region, for the state, rather. Oh, okay. They come from a state level. So, like, how do they check behind her? Like, what they do? They check her work. So, like, they go it, it has to be thing? accounted. It, it has to be, she, she has a system. If, if anything, if this is not filled out correctly, she'll, and it's a headache getting an email from your supervisor because you didn't do something right. Trust me, I know, right? <laughs> you turn something in, you complete your report, you put it in an evidence locker, but say that it, say it wasn't stapled or it wasn't labeled mm. like it was supposed to. Say the chain of custody form is not filled out correctly. You're gonna get an email, or she'll email your supervisor, 
and then you'll get a, a less than pleasant phone call from your supervisor. It's happened to me before. I know. All right? She's accountable for everything in the evidence room. Everything has to be clearly marked. Everything has to be numbered. Everything has to be packaged a certain way. She's responsible for that. Wet and or bloody clothing should be collected and placed in plastic bags. Why? So that the won't be. Very good. After being transported to an evidence room, wet or bloody clothing should be removed from the plastic bag, plastic bag and placed in a secure location to dry. Okay? Do not place wet evidence in paper bags. All right? This is just another picture of a knife. If it's a spring-loaded knife and there's blood on it, do not retract the knife. All right, leave it as it is, put it in a knife box, tape it off. All right? What could possibly happen if you close that knife down, though? No, These are evidence bags. Some of them come with um, chain of custody already printed on it. But if we don't have those, if you're not fancy, you're not a fancy department like that, then you just got a regular paper brown, paper brown, paper brown bag, and you got to put your own label and all that good stuff on it. Right? These are some other bags. Depending on what it is. Um, Sometimes we have to put a red label around it. If it's a biohazard, if it's a piece of uh, glass or something. You never, well, you never put sharks in a in a paper bag. What do you first do of all, in? put it in a box. But if it's say like a cigarette or or crack pipe or something like that, uh, that's not broken. You put it in here and you'll mark it like biohazard. Has its materials inside the bag, right? We don't usually mark it with red evidence tape. You can tape it if you want to, depending on what it is. Uh, shell casing. Again, these are some markings. If you don't have any markings like that, improvise. Do whatever you have to do to mark that crime scene. Preventing contamination. The integrity of evidence may be further protected by selecting a container that will guard the specimen against damage or contamination. Place each item in its own container or paper wrapping. So like the picture, or was it on the video where they had dumped all the evidence into one paper bag? Don't do that. Every piece of evidence gets its own bag. This is especially true if evidence contained or is suspected of containing foreign matter, such as stains, paint chips, metal bonds, or dust. Okay? This precaution is highly critical whenever evidence is to be scientifically analyzed as contamination may lead to false conclusions. If you contaminate evidence and you try to present it before a jury trial and they can establish reasonable doubt, your entire case gets thrown out. Gets thrown out. You don't want to contaminate evidence. Again, the chain of custody stuff, all efforts to properly collect, mark, and package evidence may be nullified if the officer or crime scene analyst cannot account for the person who have handled or stored evidence. Okay? If I give you something, you give her something, she, you give her something, but y'all not on this chain of custody, do you think that would, you think that would uh, support reasonable doubt? Or it's still reasonable doubt? Yeah. I, I say it would, because if I if I find out if I find out as a as a uh, defense attorney that evidence was mishandled because I gave it to two separate people and their names were not put on this chain of custody, I don't know what she could have did with that evidence. I don't know what you could have did with it. You know what I mean? The chain of possession begins when an officer discovers evidence and continues until the time the specimens are presented to the court. So once you've got it securing an evidence locker, if you're going to check it out, take it to court, guess what you're going to fill out? Chain of custody. All right? The 
testifying officer must know and be able to establish who had possession of evidence at all times. Everybody, if you handle the evidence, your name will go on a chain of custody form. If the officer cannot account for his signature or any step in the handling of the exhibit, the defense will be quick to question the integrity of the uh, admissibility of the evidence and most frequently prevent its submission to the case. So if I ask you, hey, whose signature is this? Yeah, I don't know who that is. Well, motion to suppress that evidence because you don't know whose signature that is. Make sense? Chain of possession can be established at the integrity of the evidence protected by following some basic safeguards. The number of individuals who handle the evidence from the time it's found to the time it's presented to court should be limited to those, to those who have direct and compelling reasons to handle those items. In other words, if you don't have any reason to touch or handle this evidence, you don't need to touch it. Make sense? If the evidence leaves the officer's possession, he or she must record in his or her notes to whom it was given, the time and date it was given, and the reason it was given to that person. When it was returned, if it comes back. The officer should make sure that the person handling the evidence affix their name, badge numbers, or title, and assignment to the package. Again, if you handle the evidence, your name needs to be documented. It is critical to obtain a signed receipt from the person accepting the evidence. That's what these are for. Okay? If you're signing for something, I'm going to keep this white copy and you're going to get one of the yellow or the pink ones. Make sense? These are some evidence, uh, kind of like how this is evidence in chain of custody, all right? Signature or ID number. Item number one, date and time, released by me, received by you, all right? Follow us, so on and so forth. Questions? Comments? Concerns? All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. Group, you are free to go.